And I'd like to introduce Fire Chief James, better known as Jimmy Isaacs, the town of Boone, North Carolina. And he has experience, obviously, with managing incidents that we uh, are talking about today. And uh, I'd like you all to welcome Fire Chief Jimmy Isaacs. Okay, uh, thank you. This project kind of uh, evolved. Uh, we were a compass track user uh, for several years and reached a point where we were starting to have incidents outside our normal coverage, as you referenced before. And to, to give you a little background on why our coverage is, is such an issue, is we're, we're located in northwestern North Carolina. We're in the Appalachian Mountains. Our, our elevation runs from about 2,000 feet to about 5,500 feet in the area that we're responsible for. Uh, we cover an area that's fairly densely populated. We cover a town with a population of about 20,000. Uh, we have Appalachian State University that has an enrollment of about another 20,000. Uh, plus, we cover a rural district that covers another 40 square miles that surround those two areas. So we, we cover a fairly diverse geographical area that typically does not always provide for the best coverage. Uh, next slide, please. So as, as we evolved with, with Compass Track, originally on our, on our server, we found several uses that were extremely beneficial that we didn't necessarily think about when we started using Compass Track. Uh, it was mainly implemented for resource accountability on wildland fire and normal day-to-day -day operations. One of the things as we evolved in this was the search and rescue aspect. Uh, with the search and rescue aspect, we were always second guessing ourselves on how well did we search an area and how effective were we. And with the search replay or the replay option, we found that we were able to speed our searches up significantly. Uh, once the victim was located, we were able to immediately see where they were at, not having to depend on coordinates to be called back in and plot those. Uh, we were able to speed the extrication process up. Uh, that ended up being something that we really didn't anticipate but became a tremendous benefit. And, and the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is because the Compass Respond actually uses a version of Compass Track behind the scenes. Actually, I tend to use the compass track screens and the respond setup more than I do the respond screens. But it's it's a tremendous product from that aspect. Uh, another thing that we intended to start with but became even more beneficial was on wildland fire. Uh, from the wildland fire aspect, we were able to provide much better situational awareness in, on initial attack than we we ever anticipated. Uh, it was a benefit to give that immediate feedback, fire location, us see it on the map where they said they saw the fire were or where the lines were constructed. Uh, it, it was a benefit that far exceeded what we anticipated. Uh, another option that we have started looking at more and more, we have had some integration of our staff into law enforcement events. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with rescue task forces for active shooter events and things of that nature. And we were involved in one a little over a year ago which we were able to see where our people were staged. Uh, it sparked some interest with law enforcement 
because being able to see where people were at, uh, especially tactical situations where you can see where your law enforcement assets are at and avoid crossfire situations and much better accountability. Uh, that has sparked some interest that, especially with our local law enforcement that I really didn't anticipate, but they are interested. It, it works pretty good. Uh, if we need to integrate them into the situation, we have a cache of radios. We simply assign them uh, within the cache radios we have, and we're able to integrate them into the situation. Uh, one of the things that makes the Compass Respond unit even more intriguing in this situation is the ability to encrypt the radio transmissions and handle those, but yet we're still able to pass that data through to CAT, and I'll talk about that a little more in a minute on what we were able to do with that. Uh, water rescue situations with our boat crews and stuff uh, or where the rescues are taking place uh, has been extremely beneficial uh, in looking at how do we track those assets, uh, looking for alternative ways in, uh, evaluating real time where those resources are at uh, has been something that we anticipated some use for, but have used it more than we anticipated. Uh, training is something we really didn't look at to start with, but some of our training that really goes out of line of sight and looking, uh, we've used some of this with water shuttle operations and fire training uh, and being able to look at these real time uh, has made a tremendous difference in how we evaluate that and how that works. Uh, next slide. One of the things that we, we looked at was radio configuration and we were probably a little hasty with the first configuration we came out with. And we evolved this a little as we went on. And one of the things is the IP address scheme to get each radio assigned an IP address, how we want that radio to identify. Uh, if you'll notice on the, the, the end of the Excel spreadsheet that's shown, it's got an, an AVL display name. And if you'll notice, each of those has got a four digit code on the end of it end of it. The purpose of that four-digit code is the limitations with a tape stream is to pass that data through to where it can be passed to another service is limited to four characters. So since those four characters are basically the MDF, MDC ID or the last four, the P25 ID, that gives us a uniform number that we can display and then recreate that alias on the other end. Uh, me personally, I, I like to simplify this as much as possible. I want the devices to show what they actually are uh, with personnel, it's first name, last name, first initial last name, and we rebroadcast it back that way. Uh, this was kind of a learning curve that we went through when we started pushing this data to CAD uh, from our Compass Track system. And it's the same mechanism we use to pass data from Compass Respond to Compass Track. Uh, it works the same way, which in turn takes what data, as long as we have an internet connection, it takes what data we see in Compass Respond and can pass this data over to Compass track, which in turn sends it to CAD. Next slide. Early on, uh, we started out and had a had an individual radio that we hooked to the Compass Response system. And what we discovered is that radio, even though it stayed with the box that we kept the laptop and everything in. It, we found it was probably better to configure all radios the same way. That way, if we had a radio issue, we keep one zone within the radios that are configured 
to operate as a gateway radio if need be or a subscriber radio that need be. In one zone, we keep both uh, VHF configured and 700. We run all dual band radios or tri-band radios, depending on the, whether it's seven or 8,000 version. And we have both the VHF and 700 uh, direct channels to run encryption, uh, either AES or ADP. Uh, one of the things that we discovered early on is the benefit of the encryption. Uh, when some of these operations that we're using these systems on, we're needing to pass uh, pretty sensitive information. Some of the searches have turned into body recoveries and, you know, being able to encrypt and limit the number of people that can hear that information has been extremely beneficial. Um, early on, we determined that the mobile radios as a gateway radio gave superior service. Um, the range is, is much, much better, both uh, on the receive and transmit side and we, we found that that was a, a beneficial, beneficial operation to go to. Uh, we also use some of the FutureCom uh, DVRs or digital vehicle or repeaters uh, that do help with this sum. Uh, the device that you know they're talking about, the 8000 series, is a good device. Uh, we've demoed some of those and will probably add one of those to our equipment as a mobile repeater. Uh, it would be the simple process of configuring the radios to, uh, to utilize that. Uh, next slide. As I was talking a little bit ago, some of the uh, functionality and interoperability with the other CompassCom products, uh, if you'll notice in the center of the screen, there's a radio that's listed as a, shows a green radio with the word spare one on it. That is a radio that's being transmitted into the normal compass track system on the server via internet connection from compass respond. Uh, you'll notice the only difference, it does not have the four letter identifier on the end of it. That's one way we can tell what's there. One of the big benefits that, that we saw in, is allowing us to configure is how do we identify, you know, what's coming from where. If we've, we've got a group that's basically listed as a respond group in Compass Track and it allows us to identify which radios are coming from the respond system. This one is colored by yellow. The active radios on the other system are colored by red. One of the things early on that we found was the ability to integrate our own GIS data, uh, publish our map services, <coughs> and integrate those in. We have also got into some situations where we needed to integrate data into this system on the fly. If you look over on the left-hand side of the screen, below contours and you'll see the term roads where it's expanded and you'll see the secret trail underscore GPX. We had a search operation going on one night on a series of private trails that none of us were really aware of. Uh, one of the local homeowners said, well, I've got those trails on a, on a GPS. Uh, we downloaded the GPS, sent those trails to our GPS tech. Uh, this was one or two o'clock in the morning. Uh, published it to a map service, and we were able to bring that map service into the system uh, where we could see it both from the Compass track system, which we were using at the time, or it will work with the Compass response system and integrate that data in. If you look at the one we have now, we have road data with our road names, which sometimes the generic data from uh, your providers is not accurate. 
We also have 20 foot contours turned on on the screen, uh, which gives us the ability to bring a good bit of data in and customize that data to fit an individual need, uh, which is something that has been extremely beneficial for us. Uh, we have uh, parcels turned on where we can identify on those if we need to. Uh, we also bring in more recent photography. Uh, I think we've got 2018 uh, ortho photography, high resolution that we can supply to this also, which is what you're looking at on the screen. Uh, next slide. And this is just another slide of some of the services we add. Uh, all of these services come from our uh, GIS server. We're able to integrate those in, uh, which really makes this product much more customizable and much more useful uh, in the field. Uh, some of the photography will be older than what we currently have that uh, comes through the state. So it, it's been a tremendous asset to do that. Uh, next slide. One of the things that uh, we find beneficial, depending on what the cadence interval we decide to set on the radios. Uh, on the compass track system, we run a five minute cadence interval. Uh, when I was doing the testing and most of the time on the response system, we run from a one to five minute cadence interval. If we're running a five minute cadence interval, you know, somebody can move a good bit in five minutes. If I want to double check, I've always got the ability to come in and pull that individual radio to validate that position on, on an as needed basis. And that is a function that we use a good bit. That's one of the reasons that most of what I do, I, I do in the compass track side of the compass response system uh, is because of the functionality that it gives us to do. Uh, next slide. Breadcrumbs and crumb lines is, I like to play with those and lengthen those out a little. Uh, they can get a little cumbersome if I've got a lot of radios and on at the time. But one of the things I've found as people are moving, it gives you an opportunity to see if they're headed where you wanted them to go or if they're headed where you think they're going or if it was just a detour or something that you were moving around. This, this setup here was basically left the house, basically walked a loop and came back and it kind of gives you a interval of that we can follow what's going on. Uh, the breadcrumbs I've found provide a tremendous amount of help in, you know, kind of anticipating where somebody's headed, uh, being able to head them off or change direction of them uh, before they get too far if you need to. Uh, next slide. History replay was a part of this that I really did not anticipate using, but the more we got into it, the more we used the history replay portion of this. Uh, this was all done with a one minute interval. So you can kind of see the spacing between the red arrows, which are basically breadcrumbs from the History replay, you've got the ab ability to either speed up or slow down the history replay. Uh, this, where this is probably one of the best benefits that we have found is if you are trying to search an area or grid search an area and you want to validate that search area before you move to the next area, uh, this is tremendous in that aspect. You can watch the search area overlay to photography and you can pretty well determine real quick, did I provide an effective search of the area or do I need to search areas more or less than what I had? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This gave us with limited manpower a way to validate 
the effectiveness of the search, uh, which was really uh, paramount in, in a lot of cases. I'll give you one example that goes with this. We had a, a search in a fairly densely forested area that we had a Alzheimer's patient had been gone about approximately three hours. Uh, temperature was dropping, so we were needing to provide an effective search, but we were needing to move on to other search areas. So one of the things we'd do is we would finish the search area before we would do a reassignment, simply replay the search area on the screen, validate that we had effectively covered that, and then move them on to the next area. Uh, it probably cut our search time in half because we didn't have to go back over and backtrack anything. Uh, what we have found also with the searches like that <laughs> is if we integrate outside resources, uh, we simply make sure one of our people uh, is integrated in with each search group, or we assign one person from each search group a cache radio that's on our system. <laughs> 